We now come to the seventh and final standard responsibilities as a CFA Institute member or CFA candidate. 7A is conduct as participants in CFA Institute programs and 7B is reference to CFA Institute, the CFA designation and the CFA program. 7A conduct as participants in CFA programs. Members and candidates must not engage in any conduct that compromises the reputation or integrity of CFA Institute or the CFA designation or the integrity, validity or security of CFA Institute programs. In terms of guidance, the first one has to do with confidential program information and this is very relevant for those who are participating in the program, taking the exams. You are in no way allowed to share any information about the exams with others in the sense that you cannot talk about what topics showed up, what topics didn't show up, what formulas were used on the exam. So that violates the integrity of the exam itself. You need to be completely confidential. In fact, during the exam or before the exam, you go through several rules and you are told what you are allowed to do and not to do. You need to follow those instructions very carefully. There might be additional restrictions. For example, you are only allowed to use two calculators, the HP and the BA2+. Plus. If you try to violate those restrictions, that would be a violation of standard 7A. The third point has to do with expressing an opinion. It is acceptable to express an opinion which is different from the opinion of CFA Institute. For example, you can say that in your opinion, the exam was extremely difficult or the exam was not a good representation of what you studied in the curriculum. As long as that is your opinion, it is not a violation of standard 7A. 7B reference to CFA Institute, the CFA designation and the CFA program. While referring to CFA Institute, CFA Institute membership, the CFA designation or candidacy in the CFA program, members and candidates must not misrepresent or exaggerate the meaning or implications of membership in CFA Institute holding the CFA designation or candidacy in the CFA program. In terms of CFA membership, once you become a member, there are two major things you need to do. One is you need to annually complete the professional conduct statement and you also need to pay the institute membership dues on a regular basis. Once you earn the right to use the Chartered Financial Analyst designation, you have to follow the rules associated with the usage of the designation. Referring to candidacy in the CFA program, if you are participating in the CFA program and let's say you have cleared the level one exam, it is appropriate to state the fact that you are participating in the program, you have cleared the level one exam and perhaps you have signed up for level two. So stating the facts is acceptable. However, if you claim a partial designation, for example, if you say I am a level one, that is not acceptable under standard 7B. I would strongly encourage you to read exhibit three in the curriculum which deals with the proper and improper references to the CFA designation. And I'll just give you a couple of examples. The rest you must read because this material is quite testable. So here is an example of a proper reference. Completion of the CFA program has enhanced my portfolio management skills. This is okay. Now the following is not okay. CFA charter holders achieve better performance result. This is not okay because it is claiming that 
somebody with a CFA charter holder automatically achieves better performance results. This would essentially also be potentially a misrepresentation. Another statement which is appropriate is the following. John Smith passed all three CFA examinations in three consecutive years. So that is okay. It is a statement of fact. The following, however, is not okay. John Smith is among the elite having passed all three CFA examinations in three consecutive attempts. So claiming that this is some elite accomplishment or John Smith is part of another category because he passed all three exams in three consecutive years, that would not be appropriate. And you can probably see that statements like this can easily show up in multiple choice questions. So again, I emphasize that you should carefully go through exhibit three. Proper usage of the CFA marks. Once you earn the charter, then essentially the way you can use the CFA mark is by saying that your name. So Arif Irfanullah comma CFA. Highlighting this or italicizing or making it bold is not acceptable. Here I would encourage you to look at exhibit four, which shows how the CFA marks can be used. Also, keep in mind that the CFA mark should always be used as an adjective and never as a noun. So saying the following is correct. He is one of two CFA charter holders in the company. So notice we are saying CFA charter holder. So the CFA is an adjective. The following is not correct. He is one of two CFAs in the company. Here CFA is being used as a noun which is not appropriate. And this is a mistake that happens quite often where somebody says that he's a CFA or I am a CFA. That according to standard 7b is not an appropriate usage of the CFA mark. We are now done with the seven standards. On this concluding slide, I will just put the standards in context. The first standard is professionalism. And I would refer to this as the foundation of the standards. This essentially deals with character. If there is no professionalism or no character, then everything else simply falls apart. And you will notice that a lot of the items that are covered under professionalism, such as independence and objectivity, such as not misrepresenting and so on, actually will be found in many of the other standards. So think of this as the base or the foundation and the other standards rest on this foundation. Now, as a professional, you are first concerned with your profession, which is manifested here in standard two, integrity of capital markets. So that sits on top of professionalism standard two. After standard two comes standard three, which is duties to clients. And I've mentioned this several times. Duties to clients are extremely important, but they need to come after your duty to capital markets. You would not do something for your client if that conflicts with standard two. Take a simple example. Let's say that you have material non-public information based on which you are not benefiting yourself, but you are doing something that will make your client benefit. Is that appropriate? Answer is no, because using material non-public information will violate the integrity of capital markets and therefore this is not acceptable. After standard three comes standard four, which is duties to employers. And this comes after duties to clients. In dealing with capital markets or clients and employers, certain elements are extremely important. At the heart of the investment profession is investment analysis, recommendations and the actions that go along with analysis and recommendations. So that is important enough that we have standards directly related to investment analysis, recommendations and actions. And then also 
there will be conflicts of interest in the investment profession while we try to avoid those conflicts but it's not always possible to avoid all conflicts so there need to be standards related to how to deal with conflicts how to disclose conflicts so that would be the third layer standards 5 and standards 6 are then on top of 2 3 and 4 and the final standard 7 I would say that this is just an extension of standard one in the sense that obviously since you are practicing in the investment management industry you need to have a certain level of professionalism if in addition you have signed up as a candidate in the CFA program then you need to follow the rules of the professional body with which you are now associated. So that is simply an extension of professionalism. So I would put that over here as standard number seven. Now, a few concluding remarks in terms of your exam. On the exam, you will not be required to know that standard 1A is professionalism or standard 4B is additional compensation arrangements or standard 5A is diligence and reasonable basis. However, I strongly encourage you to learn these standards and you must know the definition of each of the standards. So for example, once you see the term diligence and reasonable basis, you need to know exactly what that means. And you know, just to emphasize this, you need to memorize the fact that diligence and reasonable basis means two things that you must exercise diligence, independence and thoroughness in analyzing investments, making investment recommendations and taking investment actions. So that's one thing. The other is that diligence and reasonable basis means that you must have a reasonable and adequate basis supported by appropriate research and investigation for any investment analysis, recommendation or action. So knowing what diligence and reasonable basis means is important. The reason I say this is on the exam you'll be given a scenario and you will be asked whether a particular standard such as diligence and reasonable basis is being violated or not. You will not be asked whether standard 5A is being violated. You will be asked whether diligence and reasonable basis is being violated. And the same holds true for all other standards. In fact, in reading one where we had a brief definition of each of the standards, those standards need to be memorized by you. And then I said this several times and I will say this again, either through reading the curriculum and or through listening to my lectures on each standard to really make this meaningful after reading every standard. And by every standard, I mean the substandard. So after reading 1A, for example, don't jump to the next standards. I want you to work through the examples in the curriculum related to each standard. So the curriculum actually calls the examples uh, application of the standard. So make sure you go through the applications. That's when you will truly learn how these standards are relevant in the investment management community. If you are relatively new to investment management and there are certain terms that you don't know, don't worry, just look it up on the internet. Go to investopedia.com and there is a very high probability that you will get the correct answer or the definition that you are looking for. So good luck. As with all other topics, the key here is practice. If you do so, then you will do fine on the ethics exam.